At this time, I invite you to turn your Bibles to Psalm 50. Psalm 50. You'll find it on page 888 in your pew Bible. We will be reading the entirety of Psalm 50, all 23 verses. Before we read the word of the Lord this evening, let us pray that he would bless it to our profitability tonight. Let us pray. Dearest Lord and Heavenly Father, we come before you again in our time of evening worship asking for your blessing. Be with your servant, help him to speak truth. Be with your people, help them to have ears to hear. Hearts that are molded and shaped by you to pursue your will. Minds to be engaged that they may learn from you. Lord, we ask that as we hear this word this evening, that you would be glorified, that your name be praised, and that your people would grow in multitude, as from this place light would bring forth light. This we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Psalm 50, a psalm of Asaph. The mighty one God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him and around around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my consecrated ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I do not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are ever before me. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the creatures of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. The world is mine. No, sorry. And all that is in it. I do not eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats. Sacrifice thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to recite my laws or take my covenant on your lips? You hate my instruction and cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you join with him and throw in your lot with adulterers. You use your mouth for evil and harness your tongue to deceit. You speak continually against your brother and slander your own mother's son. These things you have done and I have kept silent. You thought I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and accuse you to your face. Consider this, you who forget God. I will tear you to pieces with none to rescue. He who sacrifices thank offerings honors me, and he prepares the way so that I may show him the salvation of God. Thus far the reading of God's word. When I was in high school at Ileana, I know another high school story. When I was in high school at Ileana, I had the distinct opportunity as part of our class trip to go before the steps of the Supreme Court of the United States. It's a magnificent building, beautiful, marbled in this Greco-Roman style. And if you look at the very top, there are pictures of great laws that were given in history. Uh, You see pictures of the Code of Hammurabi, you see pictures of this law and that law, and on the back, there is actually a picture of Moses, and in his hands is the Ten Commandments. But if you've ever actually gone in and sit in on a session, when I was in college, I took a course on judiciary. I was interested in history, this was part of it, sure, why not, I'll take a course on judiciary, it sounds interesting. 
And one of the things we learned was the history of the courts. Where did the American court system come from? Where in the world do we come with this jurisprudence, as they call it? And one of the things we had to do was listen to arguments, what they call oral arguments. This is a person who stands before the court and delivers his case, usually an open, it's sort of like an opening statement, but the oral argument in the Supreme Court, usually it's done on appeal. So the facts of the case have already been there and they're kind of arguing and interpreting the law. And so it's usually this oration that's 10, 15, sometimes longer minutes, and it describes intricacies of a case, of how things go this way and that way, of you know, who is right and who is wrong, and it kind of argues whoever's side it is. At the very beginning of those recordings, because of course this is an official court recording we're listening to, you hear the gavel pounded. Oyez, 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 all persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. The clerk of the United States Supreme Court will say that before every single session of the Supreme Court. You might be going, wait a second, what in the world does oyez mean? Well, oyez, which is actually derived from the French, oyez, means to hear. And I apologize for all of you who know French. I know my pronunciation is terrible, but it does mean to hear. And so the call goes out, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. In our passage this evening, we have God assembling his universal heavenly court. And he arraigns the people of Israel, saying, All right, you who stand before me, you who are bound in covenant to me, it's time for judgment and justice. In verses 1 through, sp through 6 specifically, you see him call to the heavens. He claims or he calls to who he is, the one who stands before the court, the mighty one, God, the Lord. Lord in all caps there in your Bible should indicate to you this is the covenant name Yahweh. This is the name of God who, he, uh, who has revealed himself to his people in a specific way. And he says in verse 1, he speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. Obviously, knowing that the world is a globe and that the sun never perpetually sets or rises, he is calling all of creation. This is the what we in the theological terms call the partitive. In other words, he's using words for the partitive to call the entirety together. In verse 4, he summons the heavens above and the earth beneath that it may judge his people. He proclaims the one who calls this court in verses 2 and 3 as the one who controls the tempest and the fire the instruments of power and of cleansing. We are not talking about a mere judge who sits on a bench in a black robe, who pounds a gavel and maybe has, in some sense, the power of life and death on a thumb up or down. We are talking about the king of the universe here, the one who breathes and life is created, the one who speaks and worlds come into being. This is the one who sits upon the heavenly throne, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, whose sash is so bright you can't even look at it, whose hem of the garment comes down in the consecration of the temple, and smoke fills the entire place. That's the one who calls Israel to judgment. I don't know about you, but I've only been in a courtroom a couple times. Every single time, I'm, un I'm uneasy. It's not because I've done anything wrong. But I never seems to sit right with me. Even when I was a juror, and I'm just sitting on the sidelines trying to figure out what's going on and what's the truth and what's not the truth and looking at evidence and looking at testimonies and hearing certain things, 
I'm still feeling uneasy. Like, wow, there is so much presence and authority and hollowedness here. And something just isn't quite right. And you're always nervous and anxious. That was at a municipal court. Now, I'm not talking about the Supreme Court, although I'm pretty sure, pretty sure if you were in the Supreme Court, you'd be nervous too. But now we're talking about the Supreme of all Supreme Courts. We're talking about the heavenly courts of God. This is the halls of justice now in Psalm 50. You see, when God calls his people, he says, now you're in my courtroom. He calls the world's, or he calls the world as witness. Gather to me my consecrated ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens proclaim his righteousness for God himself is judge. The covenant law giver. He is the one that sits as judge. And God speaks to his people. He speaks to them in two specific groups. Notice this. He says, Hear, hear O my people, and I will speak. And he addresses Israel as a whole. The covenant people of God. The one who, is he, who he specifically has given name to. If you remember, when he wrestles with, jo- with Jacob at Peniel, and he is struck, he says, I give you the name Israel. That is the name that is given and passed down to the people and the generations throughout all history. That who is being, that who is, that is the group that is specifically being called in this court. Anyone who has covenant with God and who knows it. And he says in verse 7, he addresses them personally. Specifically, he says, I am God. Your God, in verse 7. That is a very rare instance where he says, I am your God. Sometimes we hear the passage, I am the Lord your God. We hear it in the words of the Decalogue this morning. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the hand of slavery. He establishes the premise that he is the Lord. And he is not a Lord that is somewhere over there through whose machinations the world kind of comes to be, or through whose machinations your life just kind of falls into place. This is your God, the one who calls you son and daughter, the one who specifically breathes new life into you. And he arraigns them on their charge. But he doesn't charge them with their offerings. You see that specifically in in verse 8. I do not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings which are ever before me. He says, you're doing your job. Sort of. He says, "You're, you're doing your sacrifices. You're following the code. You're following the specifics that I have mandated for you. So I don't rebuke you for that. But notice verse 9 through verse 15. It's sort of a backhanded how dare you. You might scratch your head and go, what do you mean? Well, Asaph was around in the time of the kings. Generally, somewhere in the neighborhood of the kings and chronicles, we're really not 100% sure exactly the dates and the timeline which he is on, but think the time of the kings for the divided kingdom between Israel and Judah. And he was a song master in Judah. And the problem that he sees here 
and the problem that God is speaking to his people about here are they're not the only ones that are offering sacrifices. We see time and time again God calls his people in through the words of the prophets. Why are you sacrificing to Baal? Why are you sacrificing to Moloch? Why are you sacrificing to all these other gods? And he specifically names them time and time and time again. Tear down these high places. We see in the time of the judges. Especially in, especially in the time of Gideon. Where Gideon is renamed Baal Jabruth. The one who strikes against Baal. Or Baal will deal with him. Because he tears down his father's altar to Baal and he cuts down his Asherah pole. The reason why he, specifically, why God is addressing this way is because of what was typical of sacrifice back then. In the Canaanite cultures around them, sacrifices were given as an appeasement, as a, I must offer this food and drink that I would have so that my God can eat and drink. Maybe not in physical form, but as I burn it, the material will go up to him in the, sp in the spiritual, and he'll be able to consume that way. And so most of these altars or temples or sacrifices were all specifically designed to appease, curry favor, or to feed or allow your God to grow in power. God, the covenant God, speaks specifically against this. He says, what in the, why do I need your sacrifices? Why do you think I'm having you do sacrifices? Do you think I'm having you do sacrifices because I'm hungry? No. If I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you about it. Do you think that I want your bulls and your goats and your birds because, you know, it'd be nice to have, a, 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 you know, some cattle up here or, you know, maybe a flock of birds. Would be really No. Why in the world would I want your cattle? Why in the world would I want your sheep? Why in the world would I want your birds when every cattle on a thousand hills is mine? When I am the creator of the universe and every dove and every turtle dove and every pigeon was placed in this world by my hand. I know every bird in the mountains and the creatures of the field are mine, even the ones you can't tame. He, goes, he specifically said, and God charges them for this, my issue is not that you're not giving offerings. My issue is the manner in which your offering is being given to me. You're offering sacrifices like the world offers sacrifices to their gods. You offer sacrifices because you want something. But as people need to realize, and what we need to realize, is that there is no debit credit system with God. There's no, okay, God, I've turned over this part of things to you, and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I've, I've given you my 10% for X amount of years, so now I'm going to cash in on that, and you're going to give me this promotion at work, or this job that I really want, or this house or car, or this relationship I need. Need. I've done so much for you, God. Why can't I just have a small little morsel of satisfaction? After all, you're my father and every good gift is supposed to come out of your hand. Why won't you give me your gifts? For those of you wondering, you'll never hear this sermon at a prosperity preacher's church. Because it's not about you. Worship should never be about you. 
And we do, don't we? We make it about us all the time. I'm reading a couple of different books at this time because in the adult Sunday school, we're studying liturgy, liturgics, worship right now. And it's very interesting to Michael Horton in his book specifically talks about worship and how worship in the American mind has specifically morphed. And how it's morphed into something that has become self-serving rather than self-sacrificing. We look for appeasement so that we can get what we want rather than sacrifice so we do what we need to do for the glory of God. It's so easy for us to fall into that same trap, isn't it? Or let's take this a step further. How often do we, in worship services, go, wow, I really like that passage. I really liked what God was speaking to us there. I really like what God was singing in this song or how this was going or... You know what? I never really felt refreshed. But now, after being at worship, it's almost like I was in those green pastures and cool waters. How often would we rather point out, you know, she couldn't get her kids to sit still. So distracting. Well, she just walked in off the street. Why does she look like that? Doesn't she know she's coming to church? Jeans in a sanctuary? <gasps> Why did the pastor preach that? He repeats himself all the time. Guilty, I know. Why did we sing that song? Oh, it's just it's so frustrating. I I just can't I can't seem to, to find comfort here. Why do we have to hear about sin all the time? Why do we have to hear about death all the time? Why do we have to hear about this and that and the other thing? And all of a sudden, worship is no longer worship. All of a sudden, our worship goes from being, God, what can I offer? To what in the world can I get out of this? And is it really good for me? God rebukes his people, not because they're not going to temple, not because they're not offering their sacrifice. God rebukes his people because their sacrifice is about themselves. You see, God specifically brings up his hunger, going, I don't want lambs. I don't want cattle. What God wants in worship is a clean hand and a pure heart. He's hungry for meaningful fellowship with his people. And I know I'm using illustrative and alluring language there. I'm not talking about literal. Please do not go to someone else or go to Pastor Kerry and said, Elder Josh said God was hungry. How dare he? That's not what I'm going for here. What I am saying is when we talk about worship, when we talk about specifically what God has deigned through worship, we need to take a breath more often than not. We need to realize what worship truly is. Worship can be the restoration of of that broken fellowship that we have needed throughout the week. Worship is a time and place specifically ordained so that we can be with God again <coughs> in service. God is not impressed with expressions of love and thanksgiving in the thousands and in the millions and in the billions and in the trillions of dollars. 
but rather like the widow's might. The worship that God desires is a clean hand and a pure heart where we pay our vows and we call upon Him so that He is near. And what do I mean by that? In verse 14, he says, sacrifice thank offerings to God. Worship should be primarily about gratitude. This morning, I specifically talked about we are justified. This is not our doing. This is what God specifically has done for us. If you had a hand in your justification, you could easily go, aha, God, see what I did, see what I did. And then you're putting yourself on equal playing field with God. No, new life is monergistic. Mono, one, gistic, origin. Monogenes, firstborn. It is not synergistic. It is not us and God working towards a goal together. But it is God coming down and proclaiming mine over your life and mine. God does not end there, though. He also calls to the wicked in verses 16 through 23. I should say specifically 16 through 21. In the 16 through 21, he says again, but to the wicked, God says. And again, he's not talking to a different part of people. He's not talking, saying Israel's over here and the wicked are over here. No, this is Israel. And now he's going to the subsection of the wicked. He's saying, all of Israel, this is what you're doing. But specifically to the wicked, now I'm calling you out. They appear to be his people, part of Israel. But in actuality, they live like they are not. He says specifically in verse 16, What right have you to recite my laws or take my covenant upon your lips? How dare you call myself your child? Or how dare you call yourself, yeah, how dare you call yourself my child? Sorry, slip of the tongue. You put my name upon you and then you instantly revert. The fruit on the limbs of your tree is just as rotten as it was before. How dare you call yourself under my covenant? He specifically brings five charges against them. He says, you hate my instruction. You cast my words behind you. A breaking of the first commandment. You don't listen, you think you know, but you won't be taught. Second, he says, you join with the thieves and throw in with adulterers. You specifically break the tenth and the seventh commandments. And you do so willingly, and not only by yourself in private, behind closed doors, but you do so out in the open with thieves with those who break in and steal, with those who take portions of life from others that is not their own. You endorse it and you support it in violation of the name that you claim to have. Thirdly, he says, you use your tongue for evil and harness, sorry, you use your mouth for evil and you'll harness your tongue for deceit. A specific breaking of the ninth commandment. You don't just sin as a spur of the moment. You specifically and intentionally break the law. Your heart starts percolating. And remember, out of the fount of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the fount of evil, the wicked speak. And they plan and deceit. 
forth in verse 20, they speak against their brothers. Not only do they break the fifth commandment, to honor father and mother, but the ninth commandment again. They covet, they slander, they bear false witness, they cut down, they ruin reputation, not only of themselves, but of their family. Well, I know so-and-so, but he's like this. Oh, you think you know my brother. Let me tell you about this. It doesn't matter if he's related to you or not. It doesn't matter if it's a friend or not. It doesn't matter if it's a brother from another mother. You hear about what so-and-so said about him? How often do we fall into the same traps as the wicked? And finally, the fifth charge in verse 21. The breaking of both the first and second commandments. These things you have done and I kept silent and you thought I was altogether like you. But I will rebuke you and accuse you to your face. You made me in your own image rather than the image that I have revealed to you. You thought that I was like you and that you shouldn't be like me. So you slander my name by doing the evil and then on top of it you say, but my God endorses these things. Because after all, I'm so holy and I'm just putting away my 10% but I have to have a 10% to get, so I'm going to take it from this person so that I can have 10% and then I can give that to the church. The charges here, in every sense of the word, are damning. This person here, with the fruit that they bear, deserves, and in right judgment, and in just court, is condemned. God accuses them to their face. This is not a person that will see the salvation of God. Paul would later call this the wolf in sheep's clothing. Another way to put this would be the snake in the midst. People of God, I would rather give someone the benefit of the doubt than they call themselves a Christian. I genuinely would. You bear the name of Christ, you have a certain responsibility. But woe to those who bear the name of Christ and do nothing but live like the world. And not only live like the world, but would rather, in all seriousness, be the world and do this Christian thing on the side. Finally, in verses 22 and 23, judgment and justice is pronounced for both people. Consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you to pieces with none to rescue. Even through this, there is still hope. There is still grace offered even to those who, just through what we've read here, the five charges that God brings through, there are eight of the Ten Commandments here. The only two that are missed are the eighth and the fourth. And you could easily make arguments that they broke those two.
and yet grace is still offered. He says, don't forget, there is judgment. There is specifically judgment. You who forget God, I will tear you to pieces with none to rescue. There is no one who can rescue you from the hands of God. When Jonathan Edwards in his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, when he says, you are in the hands of an angry God and you are about to be dropped into a pit called hell. There is every seriousness in that. He wasn't just using an illustrative effect to say, oh, it's kind of like this. No, it's there. It's real. And that's the warning that God gives to those who bear His name. You can't claim ignorance. And you will be held accountable for that. But he also says this. He who sacrifices thank offerings honors me. And he prepares the way so that I may show him the salvation of God. Those who live a life of gratitude and recognize who God truly is. Now you take that step back and you realize who God really is. A God of grace. And he will display his salvation. He will show his mercy and loving kindness. Even to those who have done so much wrong, where the accusations are piled thick, and yet grace is still given. You see, the plan of God is grace. Not worship for worship's sake or for appeasement's sake. Not for just going through the motions and going, ah, here's my offering, God. Okay, I did my two hours of church and I'm done for the day. But rather, God's grace should be infused throughout your life. The worship of God should be inundated with grace. It should be permeated with mercy. We must be reminded that we cannot deal with God the Most High like we deal with the gods of this world. We can't just throw money at problems and they go away. We can't just carry influence with people or sacrifice things on the altar of being liked. God doesn't operate that way. You see, the only answer for both groups is grace. And grace was extended through Jesus Christ only. We just sang it. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, brothers and sisters in Christ, when we contemplate who the covenant God is and how we are to worship him, and even our own falterings in life, we still are drawn to the one thing that binds us to God. And that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's where this all comes back. Pretty soon, my adult Sunday school is going to learn that I'm a big fan of Christocentric worship. And the reason for that is what binds us to God 
How do we have a picture of who God is? How do we understand what the grace and mercy of God can be? Because our high priest who offered himself as a sacrifice for your sin, the one who sits on the right hand of the throne of God, which extends grace and grace in abundance, is nothing but Jesus Christ himself. So why is worship centered, centralized on Christ? Why is it centered on Christ? Because Christ is the display of the face of God to all of us. The grace of God in each new day. And the mercy that we need to rise every morning. When God calls to his people in Psalm 50 and says, I am your God. Worship me rightly. Because my grace has been extended to you even though you don't deserve it. People of God, brothers and sisters, let us together realize that when the white throne judgment, as it is called, in the end of all things, when Christ comes again and he separates sheep and goats, before that day, let us be reminded worship is to be centered on Christ because we've been given grace even though we don't deserve it. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty heavenly God, ruler of the universe, you who pass judgment on all things, and you who are coming again. We pray that we, we may be reminded of who you are and what you have done. That grace would be extended to us through Jesus Christ. That we may live, leaving this place in the power of the Holy Spirit, displaying your mercy to those around us. And when we come here again, may we worship you rightly in spirit and in truth, with clean hands and a pure heart. This we ask in the name and in the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, I ask you to turn in your Psalter hymnals to Psalter hymnal number